So you might have heard about the LSC, also known as the Large Hadron Collider. And you may be wondering, why exactly do we need such a large machine? And how does such a large, large machine help us probe the nature of the universe in cosmology? And maybe even, how does testing the various properties of different subatomic particles help us understand the Big Bang? Today, we'll be exploring this topic. And to start, we will be talking about the relativistic effects occurring within a particle accelerator. As you may know, particles cannot reach a speed equal to or above the speed of light. As they approach the speed of light, their kinetic energy and momentum increase rapidly, but that is also the cutting off limit that prevents them from ever reaching the speed of light. However, as they approach the speed, some strange relativistic effects starts to occur. And these relativistic effects are those we take advantage of in particle accelerators, such as the mass energy equivalence, which allows us to make some high energy particles with a very high velocity and take that kinetic energy and funnel into creating heavy particles, such as, for example, the Higgs boson. Going into detail, we can look at how exactly a particle accelerator works. So in most cases, you have a circular path and sometimes even just a linear path. Within this path, you have a near vacuum. Around it, you have coiled around some electromagnets. These electromagnets help accelerate charged particles, often either electrons or protons, to a very high velocity. These protons or electrons are then set on a collision course wherein they collide and release all their stored up kinetic and mass energy to help create new particles. The particle products of these collisions are exactly what we're interested in. Uh, these particles have spe special decay products, which we want to understand by detecting their decay as they disappear shortly after the collision. Let's start by talking about our earliest particle accelerators, the cyclotrons. The cyclotrons work by producing a magnetic field and an oscillating electric field within a series of metallic plates. When a charged particle is sent through the field, it spins outwards in a spiral shape where the oscillating frequency of the field will accelerate the particle. The cyclotron frequency depends on the mass of the particle, and once you start reaching high speeds, the relativistic mass of the particle begins to increase drastically as the kinetic component of the total energy of the particle starts increasing as you approach the speed of light. As a result of the change in the mass, we now have to change the frequency of the electric field in the cyclotron. This effect is accounted for within the different kind of particle accelerator known as a synchro cyclotron particle accelerator. Moving on from this, we can look at the synchrotron particle accelerator. The Large Hadron Collider is an example of a synchrotron particle accelerator. Instead of having the series of plates with oscillating electric fields as we have in the cyclotron, instead in the synchrotron, we have a series of electromagnets around a ring which contains and accelerates particles moving around in the loop. As the particles move around in the loop, they slowly gain kinetic energy and so a higher velocity. Once they reach a high enough velocity, they'll be ready to collide and they can be injected into the final large loop where they gain the last amount of kinetic energy and eventually collide with each other to create the intended effect of producing high mass particles. Now, to create a given particle, the accelerated particles must have a given threshold energy which matches the corresponding product particle. Say, for example, we want to create a specific boson, like, for example, the Higgs boson. The energies of the colliding particles have to be energetic enough to make up the mass of said boson, as well as other products that come from the collision. This, of course, means that the threshold energy has to be equivalent to all those masses that are produced, as well as their kinetic energy following the collision. This threshold energy can be calculated by using the momentum four vector from special relativity and deriving the mass required to create a certain product. In this equation, A denotes the particle A and B is the particle B and the capital M is the total mass of the products following the collision. The index zero designates that it's the rest mass of the particles. Of course, then you might think, easy, I'll just get some very powerful electromagnets and a very large accelerator ring. But no, physics are never easy. So we end up with synchrotron radiation. Currently, it's mostly a hurdle for electron accelerators. However, when we look at large proton-proton colliders like the LHC, this synchrotron radiation isn't non-trivial. When a particle moves through an, electric uh, an electromagnetic field with a very high velocity, 
mostly very close to the speed of light, they start emitting synchrotron radiation, which depends on their kinetic energy and velocity. This radiation siphons some of the kinetic energy from the particle which moves through the accelerator and decreases the total mass energy available at the collision. So this diminishes the effect which a certain collider can create when the two particles collide and therefore lowers the amount of heavy particles you can create. The power of this radiation can be derived through Lamont's formula. By applying the Lorentz transformations to the acceleration component and rewriting it for the cyclical motion of the particles, you get an equation which looks something like this. When looking at this equation, we can see that both the velocity and the Lorentz factor are in the numerator of the equation. Since we are working with high velocity, near light speed particles, both of these would be very big. The way that accelerator engineers can get around this is by exploiting the inverse square proportionality to the radius. In general, particle accelerators have a tendency to be very large. Currently, for electron accelerators, this is due to the synchrotron radiation. However, for proton, proton colliders, such as the Large Hadron Collider, it is mostly due to the high velocity of the protons requiring a very light curvature of the circular element, as in the ring which in they move, to avoid the protons flying into the wall as they move through the ring. When protons start reaching a kinetic energy of around 100 tera electron volts, as previously mentioned, both issues come into full effect as they lose a significant amount of the kinetic energy to the radiation loss. When the synchrotron radiation is relevant, it suddenly becomes very important to know what amount of energy is given to the accelerated particle where it is lost to acceleration created by the synchrotron radiation, making it significantly harder to attain a given threshold energy. Due to the loss of energy to the synchrotron radiation, the bar for creating heavier particles suddenly becomes much higher due to it being harder to use all the energy you pump into the accelerator as efficiently. This means that very heavy, interesting particles, such as supersymmetric particles, the counterparts to our existing particles, become very hard to explore. explore. This is one of the very big future challenges for particle physics and collider physics in general. One of the most often stated goals of the LHC is to explore the early universe. But how exactly is this done? One way, as you might have guessed, is to reproduce the energy densities that were present at the early universe. During the quark epoch that lasted uh, a few milliseconds, the universe consisted of the so-called quark-gluon plasma, sometimes called the quark soup, or shortened as QGP. This peculiar phase of matter exists only at the most extreme conditions. Luckily, the LHC is able to recreate some of these energies. Just like regular plasma exists when electrons are stripped from their nuclei and move around freely, the quark-gluon plasma, the quarks are said to be deconfined, rather than only being allowed to exist in a set number of regions of space. They are free. But most of this is pure theory. We need to research the actual properties of this stuff. Along comes Alice. At Alice, lead nuclei at 2.76 tera electron volts collide, enough to reproduce this soup. So, what is Alice found? It's still too early to say too much conclusively, though some findings have emerged. By combining existing theories and a lot of data and experiments, some things have been concluded. First of all, the QGP seems to act like a fluid, actually the most perfect fluid known, flowing almost unobstructed and reacting to pressure gradients with little internal friction. This also means that it is best described using something called relativistic viscous hydrodynamics, which we will not explore further. The studies of the flow properties of the produced matter has shown that at high transverse momenta, the QGP is strongly coupled, while studies of the produced jets in heavy iron collisions suggest that it is weakly coupled. The transition phase is therefore still an active field of experimental and theoretical research. Alice is just one of four primary experiments the LHC houses, the others being ATLAS, CMS and LHCB. As is popularly told, in the early universe, almost equal amounts of matter and antimatter were created, which annihilated each other. Yet, seemingly, there is a universe around us, posing the question of how this could be. This is referred to as either the baryon asymmetry or as the matter-antimatter asymmetry, which is currently one of the greatest unsolved problems in physics. So, how do you study the missing antimatter? This is one of the main utilities of LHCB. Well, to be exact, it, it actually doesn't do this. It tries to investigate the nature of CP violation. 
What is CP violation, you might ask? It is the violation of CP symmetry. A symmetry in physics it means that you can apply a transform without changing the laws of physics. Well, CP symmetry is a fancy way of saying that the laws of physics should be interchangeable for each particle-antiparticle pair while its spatial coordinates are inverted. Previously, physicists believed in C symmetry, which is a symmetry between every particle and its antiparticle, while P symmetry is a symmetry for its spatial coordinates, i.e., between a particle and its mirror image. Elementary particles have a unique property called spin, meaning that they are either left-handed or right-handed. However, we have not observed any right-handed neutrinos. The same issue exists with C-symmetry. We could supposedly change any neutrino into its antiparticle. However, no left-handed antineutrinos have been observed. So both C and P-symmetry have been broken. And that's an issue. However, what if we both invert their spatial coordinates and change it into an antiparticle? Problem solved. C-P-symmetry for you right there. However, experiments starting with the fitch croning experiment conducted in 1964, earning a Nobel Prize and quite a few confused physicists in the process, has shown clear evidence of CP violation. The experiment involved splitting the decay product of kaons into multiple paths and measuring their properties. However, CP violation may help solve our issue with the missing particles that was mentioned earlier. Since there is a clear violation of CP symmetry, it means that the laws of physics do work differently on matter and antimatter. This could very well explain the apparent lack of antiparticles in our universe. In order for these detectors to gather any data of the interactions, they need to actually detect the particles. So how exactly is this done? At LS, the primary detection device is the time projection chamber. This works by tracking the motion of the reaction products. When the particles collide, they create new exotic particles. The products of the interaction will leave behind a track of ionized gas particles as it travels through the medium. The field cage surrounding the chamber provides a uniform electrostatic field that helps stabilize the path of electrons to the readout chamber at the end of the cylinder. Afterwards, we can calculate properties of the particles, including the average kinetic energy using the beta block formula. I will not go through the derivation of this Behe moth of an equation, though I will note the importance of special relativity. When accounting for relativistic effects, we have to change the parts involving velocities to account for the maximum speed limit. So we end up with something like this. In other particle accelerators, such as ATLAS or LHCb, when searching for other particles, other methods are used to deduce their properties. Another way of detecting specific particles of interest out of the Higgs boson, for example, is to look for the photons and other particles emitted from it as it decays shortly after having been created by the proton collision. Knowing the angle at which the particles are emitted from their common origin and their energies, the mass of the particle they were emitted from can be calculated using the formula from the invariant mass derived from the four vector momentum sum of two particles momentum product, which is based on very fundamental parts of special relativity. The formula can be derived very easily, however, to spare you from this, we have it here. The distinct masses of the particles is then compared to our theoretical framework, such as the standard model, and if it does not match an existing particle, we can use that to determine whether a new particle has been discovered. If it does not match a known particle, a new particle must have been discovered, and in some cases, it may even have a side theoretical framework, such as the Higgs boson, which we can compare it to. This method can be used both on leptons, photons, and hadrons. So as you can probably tell, there's still a lot going on at the LAC. We've barely touched the surface of the research going on at the LAC, and we've barely mentioned dark matter, and there's a reason for that. Dark matter research is still in its early phases, and only CMS is actively looking for candidates for dark matter, and it isn't even its primary purpose. Also, to clarify, no, there has not yet been found any particle candidates for dark matter, conclusively. 